welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Well, uh, well, this looks a little different, Blake. It absolutely does, Nick. I don't know what happened. I think the camera's in the wrong place. I think, uh, you know, some things are going on. So uh, we're not in the studio. We're in between studios. We're, we're, a, little, uh, we're a little homeless. Growing pains. We are, uh, <laughs> we're currently figuring it out. But hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined across the table from me by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Absolutely. It's nice to be across the table than just aside from you on the table. Yeah, you know what? I actually uh, I actually kind of like the across the table because uh, now I have this barrier in between us that, you know, protects me from you. Thank God. I know. We you were too close. Need it. <laughs> we were too close before. But uh, anyway, yeah. Hi. Welcome. Uh, this is episode 140. That's a lot of episodes. That's a lot of episodes. 140, um, and it's September 12th. We're coming at you a little bit later this week. Uh, if it's not obvious by the setting, that's why. So we're in the middle of a move. We're going to figure things out. We're going to get things going. The audio version shouldn't have really any noticeable difference. Maybe the audio quality a little bit. We're using different mics this week, um, but we'll be back at it. We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you. Uh, we do have some wonderful news stories to talk about this week. We're talking about how schools are being designed to minimize the number of deaths in a mass shooting. Talking about a blind man who is developing the smart cane, uh, uses Google Maps to navigate, and this optical lace that acts as nerve endings for robots touching and touching robots because we all love doing that. Finally, or we, we will can someday. Touch robots. Uh, but first, hey, you can find us every YouTube. You can find us every YouTube on Tuesday. Uh, usually Tuesday, sometimes Monday night. This week it's going to be a lot later. Um, YouTube.com slash Human Factors Cast. Uh, so, uh, Blake, what's going on with you? Not Man, really a whole lot, besides we've <laughs> lost the studio. But yeah, we did lose the studio. Something, that, something that's kind of funny. So one of our good, friendly co-workers found him or herself will be agnostic here, keep their identity hidden. They locked their keys in their car recently. <laughs> this one. And oh, man. I got a good laugh out of it because they happened to be my office mate, and it just was funny to me. Now, the something that happened to me on my way back back here so that we could record this podcast was I nearly locked my keys in my car. No. Because I have keyless entry now, so I don't ever have to hold on to my keys. So sometimes I'll put them in the put them in the seat next to me, whatever it may be. But I got out of the car, went to lock my car by touching the doorknob, and thank goodness it beeped at me and wouldn't let me lock the car because the keys were inside. So I don't know, it's kind of, it's just ironic to me that I was, you know, earlier today laughing at a co-worker and now I nearly just did it myself and thank goodness for, you know, the technology in the car just being smarter than I am. Yeah. Or protecting me, whichever way you want to look at it. Well, man, you know, I gotta say, sometimes karma uh, catches up with us. It can. You know, if you, if you believe in that sort of thing, I think... Um, it can, it can often be a, uh, an interesting situation when, um, yeah, when karma comes through. But it was a funny <laughs> thing for me, too, because I thought yesterday, like, it's funny, like, to even think that that is a problem anymore, that you lock your keys in your car. Because nowadays, I mean... Oh, I, yeah, because you have your fancy car. Yeah. Well, yeah. even, like, when keyless entry came out in general, that was kind of a big selling point, right? Like, even if you left it in the car, you're probably not going to lock yourself out of the car. Because um, I, I remember early on when when I saw the first keyless entry car key and one of my friends was telling me about the fact that they had done the same thing just left the key in the car because you don't need it in your hand necessarily or cranking or anything so it's it's kind of funny that to think about the fact that how far tech brings us in cars yeah so so you almost locked your car your keys in your car I'm going to revisit this so you almost locked Absolutely. your keys in your car yep um, and your car would not let you lock your doors because it sensed your key was in the car is that Yep. What's going on? Yep. That's the long and short of it. It's a great summation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on with you, Nick? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, um, I'm expecting baby. And a couple things here with, with the baby side of things is that, well, one, 
um, you know, for for us, uh, baby is this thing that we're anticipating, but also there's a lot of other things going on with baby. Ah. So there's a lot of accessories. There's a lot of, um, let's see, what what's the, uh, there's a lot of technology around baby. Let me put it that way. And sometimes you get lucky with the technology that you get, and sometimes it is very difficult. Uh, and sorry if you're watching on YouTube. I know there's video problems. New studio, new setup, we're getting used to it. Um, so here's the interesting thing, Blake. So I got this, so in, in a lot of cases right now, I am going out of my way. I am researching all these baby tech gadgets and devices. Gotcha. And a stroller is not on that list for the reason that we got a hand-me-down from somebody else. Now, cool. when you get a piece of technology, this advanced state-of-the-art um, collapsible stroller that is sound. interchangeable with some of your other baby parts that you're getting, right? So like I have the carrier, the baby carrier can fit into this stroller cool. and it's very cool. However, this stroller is giving me so much growing pains because, Why? okay, here's the thing. So for the longest time, I couldn't figure out how to collapse it because it's a hand-me-down. It doesn't come with a manual. Ah, so you just have to kick it shut. Yeah. And so kicking it shut does nothing. And it's almost Good like deal. they're human proofing it, like adult proofing it because adults are stupid and Can they don't want the adult to like close the thing on baby. Yeah. That makes it's, sense. It's, it's, Okay. So the way you end up collapsing this thing mm -hmm. is completely unintuitive. And I won't say the name of the stroller. There's a lot of different stroller brands out there. Sure. However, um, the, the collapsible thing is under the seat. And I don't know if that's a convention. Like you basically pull it up from the base of the seat and it collapses everything around that. I don't know if that's convention for strollers. If I'm just dumb as like a, as a, as a expectant parent, who knows? Um, kind of makes sense because that way there's definitely not a kid in it if you're pulling something from the seat, right? That's true. Uh, and then here's here's the real kicker. So once it's folded up, I actually pulled it out of the closet the other day to test it with the interlocking system that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we pulled it out of the closet, and um, you know, as I was trying to unfold it, mm -hmm. I pulled every which way. I basically tore the thing apart trying to figure out what button I pressed to, for the release. Now this was to make it open. Know, open again? Yeah, so it's folded up. I'm trying to make it open up again. I'm like, what button do I press as a release? Because that's typical when something is in a locked state, you press a button to unlock it like like, sure. uh, like seatbelts or something, right? Yeah. That's the kind of metaphor I had in my head. Uh, it was basically like a little clip that had this a uh, little flexible latch on it. So you basically had to pull up the flexible latch and then it would go. Oh. And I, this flexible latch is so damn resilient. Like I could not open this thing up. I was literally sweating and struggling with this thing. And interesting. It's an interesting feeling for sure because I'm like, if I can't even open up a damn stroller, how am I going to be a parent? You know? Yeah. And it's like one of those. Uh, but now you know how to open it. It's like a. Yeah, uh, and close it. Yeah, I know there how to you do go. both. <laughs> Everything's easy when you know how. That's kind of insane because I, I, I doubt it would be kind of funny for you to go on the internet and check the brand out and see if there's reviews of it and see if parents had problems. Yeah, I'd be curious. And here's the, here's the thing. It's a little bit older of a model, so I couldn't find like the instruction manual online. I looked and looked and looked, and I was like, what model is this? And I, I texted the people that you know gave it to us, and I was like, what is this model? I need to Jeez. know so I can just look up an instruction manual. Yeah. Hand-me-downs are rough. Yeah, it can be for sure, especially if like whoever gave it gives you the hand-me-down object doesn't show you how to use it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because like, I, I had something like that. Like I had a car winch or something, and I didn't even know how to... It was a car jack, I think is the correct way to phrase it, and I didn't know how to use it at all. I couldn't find anything on the internet, and actually it was somebody in an apartment complex that showed me how to use it for the first time. Like, oh. But see, like, I'm wondering if the stuff that that you didn't know how to use was convention for car jacks, right? Like, yeah. is this a convention for strollers that it's just a new new world for me? I've never had a stroller. I've never, like, you know. 
A-B test it. Go check I, out another. Yeah, I don't know. Go to the stroller shop and check out different ones. See if uh, what you know now. But see, part of the now. problem, Blake, is that I don't want to go out in public and just sweat my ass off trying to collapse a bunch of strollers and bye-bye baby. It'd like, be so funny. <laughs> uh, that's just not something I want to do. Anyway, we got some news stories. You want to get to them? Let's see what's going on in the news. All right. Yes, it's time for Human Factors News. It's that part of the show. Whoops, I'm talking over the intro. It's that part of the show where we like to break down all the news stories that are happening in the field of Human Factors. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as it is related to the field of Human Factors. It is fair new, fair, fair news game, fair, fair game for us to talk about with the news. Um, so Blake, I'm going to ask you in just a minute. Give me a second here to adjust some of the video stuff because man, this is. This is frustrating too. We are uh, we're really having some video problems. If you want to see it, go check it out video on YouTube. On the fly. Check us out on YouTube because this is fun. Anyway, all right, Blake, what do we got up first this week? Oh man, so lockdown drills have become the norm across in schools across the U.S. as we're forced to grapple with the threat of potential mass shootings every single day. But these schools are also being now designed in new ways to minify, minimize the number of deaths during an actual mass shooting. So there's no more lockers in hallways. Instead, short lockers are in a common area so that teachers and supervisors can see the over, over students all at once. And it's also designed, also these hallways are designed in a curve for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is to cut down the line of sight of an actual active shooter. And also installed in these wing, wing walls to provide safety for students to hide behind if there's a threat down the hallway. Lastly, in this particular school in Michigan, the state police actually paid for impact-resistant film to put on the windows and a special system to lock down specific sections of the school. I think this is kind of an interesting story because it's it's hard, definitely for people in the U.S. to have to be dealing with the fact that we've had so many mass shootings, especially over, I guess, the past year for sure, um, that's forcing a need to design things in this way. But it seems like at least people have taken an active stance in how we can make students safer at school. Yeah, I think this is, I don't know, I'm so conflicted on this. On one point, this should not, this as a social issue, should not have to be a social issue. Like the fact that, so I'm going to be a parent soon, just talked about it. Sometime soon, I'm going to have to send my kid to school. Yep. And I'm going to have to worry about them getting shot at school. Absolutely, yeah. Especially what, here. What, wow. That is shitty. Yeah, so, it's a scary thing. But uh, it is a reality that that happens. And so the fact that there are people out there who are designing campuses now around that problem specifically um, is kind of comforting in a way because, I mean, some of the design decisions in this is, is pretty cool to see, right? I mean, you have... Uh, the cur the curved hallways to me were kind of the the big point, right? Yeah. And that's to cut down line of sight, um, which is uh, which is a good thing for an active shooter situation. Um, I don't know. I my my thoughts on this are very complex. I wish it wasn't even an issue. I'm sad that it's an issue, but I'm glad that something is being done to solve it. Like or or at least minimize the impact that these horrific events happen um yeah i i i don't know what what, what are your thoughts as someone who's uh, not a soon-to-be parent um but is still a united states citizen i guess yeah so i mean it, i'm always intrigued by how to approach solving problems with design so it's it's an interesting way that they've gone about it of okay if Based on like not being able to do anything else to, you know, we can't necessarily stop school shootings or we don't really know how, what can we do to either the school or I guess basically only the school in this case. So they've redesigned the entire interior to make it a little bit easier to spot incoming threats and stuff like that. And it's, it's a great idea they've put together. Um, it's it's tough because it's a hard subject because it doesn't ultimately solve the problem, but it, I think it does provide maybe teachers and even students too with a little bit more comfort that maybe maybe if something does happen they'll be able to react in different ways than has been than they have been in the past. I mean, between having you know I, 
they don't say it this way, but like bulletproof glass that's on the on the windows and then having, you know, large vantage points and cutting down on LOS for if anybody that's walking into these curved hallways or in these circular rotundas. Um, I mean, it's obviously a great feat of engineering. Um, the hard part is it's definitely super disturbing is not the right word, but telling what I've got right now in my head that, that we're having to kind of design, redesign schools to solve this problem. And then at the end of the day, it doesn't actually solve the problem. No, but it's I a band-aid. I think it could be a good preventative measure for sure. Could have, I don't know. I just don't want this to end up also meaning that you put, you know, I don't know, armed police inside of schools too so that people understand. Because if you've read the article, if anybody in, who's in our Slack kind of got to check it out, I mean, it, it is an awesome feat of engineering and there does seem like a, re a lot of really good thought went behind the design. But even the NBC kind of article through Gizmodo is, you know, breaking down a lot of the issues that come with it because it doesn't take very long to understand a school schematic and kind of poke holes in it and stuff like that. So it's, I don't know, it's like kind of a flip of a coin how I feel about it. I think it's it's great that there's people that are actively in their community trying to solve the problem or trying to find preventative ways and keep kids safe at school. Um, but at the same time, it's really tough that we're having to worrying worry about designing schools in a way that keeps less people from dying yeah it's this is one of those like like i mentioned earlier it's a band-aid for a larger problem um but they're designing towards this problem and i i i don't know did they say in the article anywhere that they are taking other design considerations into account like how uh like like the school user experience, if you will, right? Do they, do they take any of that into account? I, I didn't catch any of that in the article. I think it was mostly focused on. Honestly, like the, the only thing they really talk about is the the structural changes. Um, if reading through the article, a lot more of it is kind of some of the negative aspects of the problem as a whole, not really focusing on the design that's been done. They definitely like to highlight the amount of money it costs the Michigan school to do this, um, but I I don't know. I think that. They didn't do the best job of kind of like highlighting more about the experience or if there's or if there's anything more that they're doing to try and I guess educate students or educate teachers or whatever. All right. Well, the education piece, we actually talked to Tammy Griffith last year at HFES, who is doing training for these active shooters, active shooter scenarios with um, educators and faculty on these campuses. So they know what to do in the case of an active shooter. So that's the training piece of it. I want to go into some of these design decisions, though, because they're cool. So, um, I mean, they're cool in the sense that they are preventative measures for active shooters. Not cool that they have to do this in the first place. Um, I think it's pretty obvious where I stand on it. But let's first talk about uh, the curve, right? So it cuts down the line of sight for active shooters. Um, and then you have things like the wing walls on the inside of classrooms, on the inside of rooms where basically this wing wall is on the inside of a room, allows people to hide behind it, um, so that way the active shooter can't see through, see any people in the room through the door. The idea is that these wing walls uh, protrude far enough into the room um, that allows an entire classroom to basically hide up against one wall, uh, so that way the active shooter can't see in the room and basically take shots at them. Um, and I, I think they actually even go into, you may have mentioned it too, the resilient walls. Um, yeah, so the impact-resistant like, film. They put all across the school, it seems like. Yeah, so they put resistant impact-resistant film on the windows. Um, and uh, I, I'm curious to see what materials they use in the wall. I'm, I'm sure they probably put like a lot of concrete in there so that the shooter just can't, like, if they know what the wing wall is there and everyone's likely just hiding up against that wall, I would imagine they would, you know, they'd put, reinforce that wall there to make it so that way the shooter just can't go through. Um, they also have these, uh, I I'd be interested to find out a little bit more about these safety systems where they lock down specific sections of the school. Um, and I'm wondering if those are more like, uh, uh, like the like the doors on ships. I don't know what they're called when, you know, we you section off a ship so that way the water doesn't yeah, the, it's kind of like the whole closing door. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I imagine. It's like if, if an instance is detected in a certain part of the school, they lock it off. Um, 
and hopefully they have methods of extraction for the people that are in that section as well. Uh, and I mean, like, if you basically lock down a section, um, you have to be strategic about it, right? Like, I, I wonder if this school will have security cameras that allow the administrators to see where the action is happening. I feel um, like you'd have to to make any of this, some of this stuff effective, right? especially with the like lockdown stuff, right? Yeah, because all they're like they've got a schematic for where the lock. I'm assuming where the lockdown yeah, portions that, yeah. could be. And I mean, they're so widespread. This is a pretty big campus for a high school. I'm assuming it's a high school. Uh, but school in general, public school. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of what looks like lockdown points throughout the entire campus. I would imagine you have to have some kind of coordinated system that people, either administrators or a security team or whatever it is, can access and kind of be more in control of the flow of things. Yeah, I mean, there is a downside to all this stuff, too. I mean, this is tough to talk about. Like, let, let me be clear. <laughs> all this is tough to talk about um, for the reasons I mentioned at the top. But uh, there, there is also some of the downsides with this type of system, too. The author of this Gizmodo article points out that this type of lockdown system can actually be used to the shooter's advantage. If they take control of it, they could lock 900 students in a portion of the school and just go. Um, and that's scary. Um, yeah, I so, mean... So there has to be, like, safety around this area. And I imagine... I'd imagine this would be cordoned off with the administrators and hopefully they have like a button that they can just hit and it locks them in that room. Um, but then that also works the other way too. If the, if the active shooter somehow gets in there too, they could lock it down and just stay safe. I don't yeah. know. It's, it is a catch 22. It's like, especially with what we're seeing in America anyway. I mean, a lot of the time or all of the time, probably not all the time. That's probably too, general of a statement but the majority of the time it's it's a student hitting something like this anyway so i mean you're if you understand kind of the mechanics of the way this is all designed you can use it to your advantage that is kind of the problem at the end of the day um because i mean great right, you can hide yourselves within classrooms but does it does it make the ante up i guess because like they understand that there's a design it's designed in a way that you won't be able to see people's yeah. All right. I don't want to talk about this anymore. What do we got up next? All right. Up next. So cities are difficult enough to, to navigate at the best of times, but for people who are visually impaired, they can be like an obstacle course and a maze wrapped into one. Actually, a UK national travel survey found that adults with mobility difficulties took 93% fewer trips than those who have no disabilities. And so a new, a new smart cane is set to change that by revolutionizing revolutionizing the way that blind people can navigate the world in order to guide its user around a low around both low-hanging objects and obstacles above the chest the we walk smart cane uses ultrasonic sensors to warn of nearby impediments through vibrations in the cane handle so the cane can be paired with the we walk smartphone app via bluetooth and using the touchpad controls on the smart cane, the user can then control their smartphone without ever having to take their phone out of their pocket, leaving one hand free for other tasks like hitting the stoplights or hitting the walk signs. That's pretty, we've come across so much great technology that really gets at helping the visually impaired over the past couple of years, and this is just another instance of it advancing. Yeah, I don't remember what the other one was called. It was, um... Well, I know we had a strange one from Microsoft. Yeah, it was, uh, it was the it was like Cane Troller, I think it was. Right? Yeah, it was had a it? funny name. It was either that or something close to it, but it had something a similar concept of using the vibrations to kind of help guide somebody. Yeah, it was definitely the Cane Troller. Uh, I think Woodrow actually saw this when he went to Kai a couple of years ago and did yeah. coverage for us. He actually saw the Cane Troller there. Um, and this is kind of a similar concept. I'd be curious to see how they compare and contrast. Um, but I always think it's cool. Like I mention this on the show all the time, but accessibility is cool. I think accessibility um, and designing for those with limited capability to do something, in this case, see or use their sense of vision, uh, I think that's very cool. And providing the opportunity for those people uh, to interact with the world in a more efficient way is just cool. I, I don't have any other words for it than cool. 
Uh, and this specific example of using a cane with vibrations and it actually ties into uh, Google Maps, right? Um, so the, the kind of benefit to this one is that it sounds like they have control over their phone as well. Uh, so they're able to, to uh, use these touchpad controls on the cane to actually use their smartphone without taking it out of the pocket. So, you know, they're, they're sitting there and um, they're using the cane and they're getting all the feedback from their app, whether it's Google Maps or, or whatever other app they're using. Maybe they're using that, that app that we talked about a while ago where it kind of describes the situation around you, you know, like there's a Starbucks to your left and there's a coffee shop to your right and Starbucks and coffee shop are the same thing, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, maybe they're using that and they control that app, you know, and they control the volume and everything like that. So there are ways uh, that they can use this with other technology. Uh, so that's cool to Definitely. see. Definitely. Yeah, so it looks like their goal too is to also kind of expand the technology that they have out in the world that they can integrate with. So they're hoping to, it looks like anyway, based off of their website, try and integrate with like third-party systems that may be embedded in the city, so maybe bus systems, and also bring in Google Voice so you're able to kind of interact with with your voice assistant, again, without having to have your phone near you or out in your hand. It's all kind of done through the canes. Um, I guess handle would be the appropriate word in this case, the way it's designed. But I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, they've really, like, I, so I kind of started doing a little back and forth comparison looking at the original um, cane troller versus this kind of Ewok cane. And it's like leaps and bounds of difference because obviously the, the Microsoft one was much more in a like research and testing phase, but there was so much kind of encapsulated in it. Like it had a braking system, like extra pieces that had to be separate from the cane and things like that. And this has really rolled everything into, you know, basically one simple looking cane that's got a, a small touch pad that you use your thumb with on the top. And you know, otherwise it just looks like a normal cane. It's it's pretty great to see this technology coming together. It'd be it almost would be fun to get my hands on one and just like get a sense of what it's like to interact with it. Well, it could be yours for the low low price of five hundred dollars, and I think that's actually quite reasonable for the technology that this thing boasts. Um, Especially as... with the expansion they're talking about with the different systems that they want to integrate into it, I think that this it's definitely well worth probably the price. Yeah, I think so too. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't have much else to say other than this is cool. I want to see what other types of applications uh, this can have. I think we can maybe speculate what type of applications this could have, but uh, I don't know, man. What, what's, uh, what's your thoughts? I'm really excited about the fact that it's got like a touchpad on it that's basically allowing you to interact and control with your phone in a similar way that you would, I guess, with your smartphone now without having to have it in your hand. So right. I think that it, this is going to require something that we were even like sighted people's technology hasn't really mastered and that's the like the ability to really integrate very well with a voice assistant and it making the right calls based off of what you ask it for sure yeah so i think it's going to require like i think it's going to require something better than you know integrating with just google's assistant or their google's assistant will have to step up its game really far um, but it th so I think this is a really great test case for people really using that feature and getting robust data from them on what can be improved. Um, but it, the other thing that kind of blows my mind is, is it's got an ultrasonic sensor on it that's kind of sensing the world around them. It's, it's just continually mapping the world and providing enough feedback both through vibration and I'm assuming verbally in some cases if you're using like Google Maps. Oh, I'd imagine so. Um, right? so. It has to tell you what's nearby. So it's great like just uh, the te technology stack, in, if you will, that's put into this thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of like application beyond this, I'm, um, I'm not really sure what the future holds for it because it, they've got like a, so they've got even a symbol for like, and this is actually on their website too, a symbol for like Messenger, because I'm starting to see Facebook Messenger okay. be integrated into everything. So it's almost like, are there, it's, it's looking to not only, you know, 
provide a better experience of getting around the city, but also like connect you with people across the internet. Or so, distract you from your surroundings. Which could be scary enough, right? Like if you, if you yeah. can't see and you're being that's distracted by yeah. notifications, that's pretty, that's gotta be pretty intense. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, we will be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this short break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Yeah, it depends. It depends on uh, all that all that extra Human Factors Cast Infinite content. I, I plug this every week, but if you pay as little as $1, you could hear us less. Go check it out. We actually just added this. It's a truncated version of the show. Um, if you like podcasts or you recently moved and can't listen to the whole show all the time, that's okay. We get it. You can listen to a truncated version. All this advertisements for the... Uh, infinite go away um and it's just uh the news stories it's not our banter it's not it came from reddit it's just a, a short condensed version of the show which uh for every for your commute yeah honestly blake you know what i i so i i do a qc on our shows you do i do i just do like a quick search through to make sure the audio quality is good to make sure that you know levels are good and whatnot um i do listen occasionally to some of the stuff that we talk about to make sure that we don't sound like total idiots uh, and uh, you know what? I really like the truncated version. Well, good. I mean, it's less of us <laughs> with more quality content. I think it might be the way to go. Yeah, I think so too. Um, anyway, uh, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Gizmodo, IEEE, uh, and Adapt Network, and the Hackster IO. Is that still in there? It is. All right. Well, thank you for all of our news stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can join us all over social media for links to the original articles. We do post them in our Slack. Uh, as we find them. So, yeah, go check them out there, and uh, you, can, you can get all the links to the original articles. All right, Blake, we got one more news story up this week. We got a shorter news cycle this week, uh, but what's up for the last news story? Before we get into the last news story, I actually want to clarify something about the cane troller from the last story. Oh, okay, all did, right, let's get into the clarification. Yeah, I did a little bit of reading while we were in the commercial break. So one reason that the I was giving the cane troller a hard time about the way it was designed, the way it was put together, I had totally forgotten that it was meant to provide a virtual reality experience for people using it. So oh, hence okay. the way it was designed and it had like a very, you know, prototypey and lots of wires feel to it. So I apologize to any Microsoft enthusiasts and just wanted to make that clarification now. Oh, yeah, we don't want them on our case. All right. Absolutely. All right. Not. Now what do we have up next? All right. So up next, robots today still often rely on one or two kinds of sensors and that can inhibit their ability to actually interact with the world. But Cornell's university has developed optical lace that can act like nerve endings and give robots a sense of touch. So animals, including humans, can feel, th feel thousands of individual points across their bodies, and it's been difficult to replicate that in a practical way by artificial means. However, this optical lace has managed to do so in a very novel way, at least in a, sm in a relatively small scale. So more importantly, it appears that it could the idea could be expanded to afford cover large areas with touch sensors. So this could allow robots not only to feel an object, but feel how hard they're pushing on it. Something super important with, you know, robots interacting with kids. So that is incredibly important for robots working with humans and delicate objects. And the Organic Robots Lab at Cornell has even created a startup company to utilize the optical lace for wearable sensors in clothing. So man, we really are getting closer and closer to having that, you know, robot friend that can be in the house with you and you don't have to worry about them, you know, hand in half if you shake their hand. Breaking your hand, breaking your stuff. Yeah, it's it's um it's cool to see this. I I think 
I'm struggling to find the human factors application with this other than the fact that if robots are more sensitive to touch, they then have less, there's less risk associated with them hurting humans, right? If you attach these sen sensors, let's say in like an automobile factory on robots that are moving their arms across these areas in which humans operate, and you have these pads on them and it collides with a human, it might be able to like, if you put a little bit of buffer on there that shows or that allows the robot to perceive what it's touching, if it feels that it's a soft, squishy object that is moving with the motion of the arm, it could stop dead in its tracks and potentially prevent some injury that happens with the human. So I do think there is some application beyond just giving robots the sense of touch that does benefit humans, uh, and it's kind of interesting to see. I think one way that we might be able to apply some of this, and this is kind of really thinking futuristically, but taking that lace... Oh, we don't do that here. We don't think futuristically. Yeah, yeah, we try and think inside the box consistently. But one thing you could do with like being a, with robotics being able to now kind of sense human touch or like how hard they're pressing on something is I could see this somehow being rolled into something like an exoskeleton that gives people more capability to either lift things that are heavier or adding robotics to an actual exoskeleton. And in this way, it's able to actually feel the impact that it may be having on a human's body. Let's say if you went to lift something with your legs that was way too heavy and this, it causes the skeleton to buckle. Well, in this case, maybe the skeleton can now sense that it's grasping your legs too hard or, you know, put you in a different position. I think over time we should see like different applications of this in terms of how it's going to impact a human. I think the other big one is it gets us a step closer to really interacting with robots more on a day-to-day -day basis outside of, you know, the industrial setting where we've talked about with automobiles and stuff like that. Right. I think the... Huh. I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room here, but I think this type of technology allows intimacy with robots to become a lot more um, viable. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be a big market when technology gets to that point. And so uh, the fact that when you are, or if a robot is able to at, respond to various levels of touch that you are exerting on it, I'm trying to stay fairly family friendly here, folks, <laughs> but if a robot is able to respond to touch at varying levels that you're able to give to it, um, it could provide uh, uh, sort of these thresholded stimuli. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be very family friendly here, so I'm sure all the adults know what I'm talking about. Well, but... I can also roll it back to something that we talked about a couple <laughs> weeks ago, too. Sure. We talked about, it was, it was a story that just reminded me of Luke Skywalker hand for prosthetics. And if we're talking about being able to actually, you know, from a robotics or a prosthetic standpoint, be able to basically plug something into your nerves that helps helps you basically gain faculty to some sort of prosthetic, this could also, potentially, I'm assuming, Link the provide up. feedback to yeah. it. Yeah, so now, now you've got not only like functionality potentially of, let's say, a hand, but hopefully through something like lace and communicating with the robotics, it's communicating with your nerves, you'd be able to actually have a very much fully functioning hand. So you yourself wouldn't have to worry about, you know, breaking that glass when you go to drink some water or, you know, slamming the door too hard or something like that. And again, it's real futuristic sounding, but I think with the combination of technologies, it could be possible. Now, yeah. I won't even begin to try and say that I understand the or what's going on in the organics robotics lab and how it could be applied to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, but it feels like it can't be that outside of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is cool for many applications and it's going to be interesting to see how exactly it sort of uh, hooks into some of those other technologies like you were bringing up with the prosthetics, with the industrial settings, even with uh, like toys and whatnot as well, right? Around yeah. the house, you imagine like a little robot dog that you bring home and you pet it and it responds to stimuli in various ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like you rub its belly and maybe you push too hard and it growls at you and you know, like that's kind of cool to think about that type of application with toys 
Um, especially for parents, I'm thinking everything through the lens of a parent now, especially for parents who don't want to buy their uh, children toys or buy their children uh, a living, breathing thing like an animal that they could hurt or that, you know, they know they won't have the time to take care of. They can give them a toy that gives them that same type of satisfaction. Those dog toys and cat toys are getting more and more realistic. Sure. Like, or it could even like in your case, right? Because you have you have two cats, only two. We have cats. Yeah. Two cats. You could you could like use something like that to help teach the child that, that like how to interact with a cat. Pet the kitty. Be be soft with the cat. Be gentle. Yeah, there's a lot of cool applications of it. I'd like to see how they move it on forward. Yeah, me too. Um, Especially since the, and the the one part I don't understand, and I I hope we hear a story about it here in the next couple of weeks, is the startup is not applying necessarily to robotics. They're putting this skin nerve sensing lace or whatever you want to call it into wearable sensors on clothing. So it's like it's taking in a little bit outside of this the realm of just robotics and now putting it into clothes as sensors. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's that's neat. The wearable sensor aspect of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's cool. I, Make sure your shirt's not too tight. That's yeah. Nice. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on here. It's time for that part of the show. This came from... It came from... Yes, it came from Reddit. It is that part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that the community is talking about uh, now, any subreddit is fair game as long as it promotes discussion within the community and, you know, Blake, it passes the Blake test. If it passes if the Blake it test, it passes we're in the trouble. Blake test, it is good for us to talk about. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get into these. So, this first one here is by user Calocity. Um, what and it was posted on the user experience subreddit is that true no this is the human factor this is the subreddit. human factor subreddit we got a rare human factor subreddit post here um the next one's the ux subreddit that's what i was reading okay so this one's by user callicity uh what do you recommend i do while working on my ba to maximize a potential spot in a master's program big question it's a big question what you got blake so the, there's a couple more bits in her, or I'm assuming it might be her, so I won't assume. In this person's question, they've also got some statements, right? So it's obvious to keep my GPA high, get sol solid letters of recommendation. Is there anything else that I should be looking out for? And in my opinion, yes. If you plan to go to master school, the one thing that I almost messed up on and luckily found a way in at the last second in my last year was to have experience working in a laboratory prior to going to grad school. Because I didn't, I didn't know until I got into the lab that that was going to be a really big part of my application process to show that I had actually applied some of the stuff that I had been learning in school and that I was responsible enough to you know, help out with a, a lab and took all the kind of ins and outs that came with that. So that's a big one to look out for. And another plus would be if you know where you're going to be applying to grad school, I would start reaching out to professors that work there. Like not even worrying about like having my application filled out or what my GPA or letters of rec look like. Like get interested in their research and start having a conversation with them yeah. now. Because they're, they're the ones that are going to read your admission letter. And if you've already like made some rapport, that's, that can get your foot in the door no matter what else you've got on your resume or what's going on with your GPA. Yeah. Um, and even sometimes, I, I've, I know a specific case where this happened, like somebody just had a really great idea for a thesis that they pitched to a thesis chair or a researcher at a university, and that's how they got in. They weren't even like in the same realm of, you know, in my case, wasn't a, didn't have a psychology background, had no psychology experience at all, but ended up in a program that was based on masters in psychology. So I'd say interact with professors and then also try and get yourself some lab experience. Yeah, uh, Blake, I want to apologize to our listeners because we're in a new environment. We are, and you know things things kind of slip under the radar. So I didn't read this whole post. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read this whole post because I feel like I owe it to this person. Okay, so applications are opening and I'm starting to apply to schools to transfer to for my BA in psychology. My end goal is to get a master's in human factors and work in the human factors field, so getting into good master's programs is very important to me. Knowing this, I want to make the most of my time working on my bachelor's degree. 
What would you recommend I do while working on my, ma my bachelor's degree to maximize a potential spot in a good master's program? For example, I hear research is very important when doing your BA if you want to get into human factors. Can somebody possibly elaborate on this? Blake just did. Go back to 30 seconds. Uh, specifically, if there's a certain focus research I should be doing. Uh, then there's the obvious, like keeping a high GPA, solid letters of rec. Is there anything else I should be looking out for? Thank you in advance to anyone who took the time to read this and respond. It means a lot to me. Um, so, yeah, Blake, I think all your points are spot on there. Uh, there's a couple points that I want to touch on here. Um, so you elaborated on the research aspect of it, but I want to elaborate on the connection side of it. You said reach out to the professors. I think reaching out to other people, not just the people that you want to work with. Uh, if you have a school in mind uh, that you want to go to that has, a ma uh, that has a master's program that you like, I think it would be in your best interest to maybe reach out to a couple of them, um, even if they are not your uh, like area of interest, if that makes sense. The, the biggest thing here is connections. And if you can go to something like HFES, uh, in the meantime, while you're still completing your bachelor's, I think that could be really helpful, especially if you meet these people in person and say, hey, I'm planning to apply to your program. And um, you know, specifically, I'd like to work with you. That, that could go a long way, because then people will go, oh, that's right, that's the person I talked to. They seemed really into this when I was there. Uh, I'm gonna take a sure thing over a chance, you know? Like, I don't know, yeah. I, I feel like there a lot go, connections go a long way. And so if you can go to one of these events where you are going to run into faculty that you know are in the program that you're looking at, do it. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty big no-brainer there. Uh, it, if you are a student in school, um, chances are you may not have the resources to get out to a conference. However, uh, do look into what your college has because I know a lot of colleges have sort of these um, scholarships or, or uh, programs that allow you to go to these um, conferences and they'll reimburse you for some of your expenses. So, so there are resources available to you and that's something that you should look into as well. I kind of got a couple more things do it. rereading Let's go. this. Yeah. Um, since you... Since like we're in 2019, I don't know if this was the case for you, but when I went to grad school, I didn't realize that there was human factors at all. I didn't know that that was a thing. But a lot of people in my program actually had gotten undergraduate degrees in human factors, and that's becoming more of the norm as I've like met people, gone to conferences. So if you're in a school that's already you know got some kind of human factors program going on, another thing you can do is get involved in whatever local chapter of HFES there is that can be super helpful for you right off the bat. Um, and even better, if they, even if it's not the school you want to get your master's in, if they have any programs that are doing like HF research, that's another way that could get you to a conference as well, like presenting a paper or whatever, a poster. Um, the other thing is, and I, did, I definitely didn't know this in school because I thought I was going to, you know, get my master's and then get my PhD and become a professor at some point. <laughs> so, so that definitely didn't happen and i would not do that now but the thing i'm just kidding i'm kidding, I'm kidding. the I'm kidding. one thing to also keep in mind is if you know that you want to do applied work or you think you may be interested in applied work and you can't get yourself necessarily into a lab to work in another alternative which could be could like really play out well especially for when applying to schools is try and get an internship that's human factors related um, that can that can help you show that you have applied knowledge and you know how to apply what you maybe have learned either in psychology or maybe even human factors in an actual job setting. And so you'd already have like maybe a little portfolio piece that you could talk about. Um, so that's kind of another route you could take. I will say you are doing a couple things right right off the bat. You are engaging in a community that's outside of your school. You are hitting up the human factor subreddit, so that's great. You're asking for advice from other people. That's awesome. Um, so keep up the good work and best of luck to you. Uh, all right, Blake, we got time for one more. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this next one here. I'm going to read it all the way through, okay? Do it. All right, I'm going to read it all the way through. All right, so this is Human Factors for AR, VR, Mixed Reality. 
Hi, everyone. Oh, you picked this because of me. I did. I don't know anything about this. Aw, this is from the UX subreddit from Anar Acronist. I think that's how you say it. A I think so. Anar Acronist. Uh, hey everyone, I am trying to get a strong overview of the current research in human factors for AR, VR, and mixed reality systems. I, all, I would also like to get a narrow understanding on the ways in which communication issues may arise when people within a group have different phenomenological experiences or access different spheres of information and thus misinterpret the actions of others or events in unexpected ways. Woo. That is a sentence that we will break down in just a minute. <laughs> Can anyone put me in the right direction of research in these areas? Maybe a good up-to-date textbook. Um, so I don't know of any good textbooks on this. However, there have been a couple really good um, articles over the last couple years, or actually even presentations at HFES that go into like the heuristics of virtual environments, the heuristics of augmented reality. Um, and I think the AR slash mixed reality stuff kind of overlap. Um, and I guess you could kind of take the two, smash them together and get a mixed reality one. But I will say, uh, you know, if, you, if you're on our Slack and you want access to those, let me know. I do have those papers. I reached out to the authors and got them. Um, and I did get their permission to spread them around. So um, those are awesome uh, resources for you. Um, I wish I could find them right now, so that way I could just kind of talk through them. You want to you want to give me your thoughts on this, Blake, while I just do a quick search? So I have like no good thoughts for this kind of stuff, but I will say the only thing that stands out to me that I know from a research background that this seems similar to, especially when you're talking about communication, is some of the telecommunication research or telecommunication. I'm trying not to say a word that came up in a paper and is just hilarious, but it's not something to talk about on the show. But it, it's, I think most of it has to do with telecommunication and then like teleoperation between teams. Are you talking teledildonics? Yep, teledildonics. Okay. That's the one I'm that's, thinking that's, of. That's, that's an okay word to say. The one thing that I would keep in mind is there's a lot of old literature on it, but it can get you like a very good sense of what's been done so far. Like leading, reading any papers by, I believe the last name of the professor that wrote a lot in teleoperation in teams. His last name was Clark look for any kind of papers related to teleoperation or te team teleoperation you'll see a lot of like how decision making and communication can be in effect affect a lot of, a lot of how how well things go in a tele teleoperation sense uh, but that's kind of the only things that i would have for answering the bulk of your communication question how to deal with if people interpret situations differently and then misinterpret actions or miss represent what they're supposed to do based on the information they've gathered. So I would look at some of the older psychology research. Um, the, the only thing I know about AR and VR and mixed reality is kind of applied systems. So I've been really playing around a little bit with Facebook's AR studio, I think is what it's called. Um, mainly just to have something to mess around with. Um, and there's plenty of different AR type kits that exist on the internet right now. So that's something worth taking a look into. And of course, like if you're really interested in VR, looking at like a and trying to get some applied understanding of maybe some of the tools behind it, Unity has a lot of awesome information, a lot of awesome tutorials that will kind of help you at least understand the tools and the scope of the space. But also, too, Unity's website is great, for, great resource for at least for the developer documentation side, like linking you to different papers or research that has been done. So that's kind of the route that I would take looking at looking up any of this stuff. But Nick, you've had more experience in the human factors portion of like AR and VR and this application, right? It's more research focused. I I have uh, I have interest in the human factor stuff. I do want to bring up though. So I mentioned um, these couple heuristics. So I was able to find the augmented reality heuristics uh, really quick, uh, and then there are some VR stuff that I. I can get you later. If, you, if you're interested in that stuff, let me know. But uh, the 10, or I guess the nine, augmented reality design heuristics are fit with user, environment, and task. So making sure that the experience are using visualizations and metaphors that have meaning. Um, number two, form communicates function. The form of a virtual element should rely on existing metaphors uh, that they know to communicate affordances and capabilities. Three, minimize distraction and overload. Don't put too much stuff on the screen. Four, adaption to user position and motion. So it needs to be able to adapt with where the user's at. 
uh, alignment of physical and virtual worlds. So you want to make sure that if there is something that you are producing in a virtual environment, that you overlay it on a physical thing and that they map appropriately. Uh, fit with users' physical abilities. You don't want to have them do things that they can't do. Number seven, fit with users' perceptual abilities. You don't want to have them not be able to perceive some information that you are putting on the screen or augmented reality device. You have accessibility of off-screen objects. So if something is off-screen, you want to be able to make sure that the user can get to it quickly and, and, you know, and make sure it's accessible. And then nine here, accounting for hardware capabilities. So you want to make sure that you are designing something with the limitations of the hardware platform in mind. That makes a lot of sense. Those yeah. are some great heuristics. Those are some pretty solid ones. I do have this paper. Again, if you're interested in this stuff at all, let me know. I have both of these available. And uh, how and can they reach you, Nick? They can get to us on the Slack. Look at that. Wow, look at that. Man, look at you. Just plug in the Slack, left and right, man. Um, anyway, do you have any other uh, closing thoughts on this one here? I think, I think we talked this one to death a little bit. But uh, Yeah, I'm kind of bummed there's not like a great textbook for this. I would like to read it. If my like with my lack of understanding but interest in the subjects it's too bad there's not something that's really stands out for anybody if anybody else listened to the show and knows of a great textbook that's related to ar vr mixed reality or and it's related to human factors let us know by all means yes please do send it our way all right everyone that's going to be it for today um let us know what you guys think of this news stories this week it's a little bit slower but you know i think uh, i think we found some things to talk about if you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned. We're going to get you that truncated version out, maybe an after show. We'll see. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over our social media channels at H Factors Podcast. If you want to, uh, you know, get ahead of everyone else in the Reddit line, you can always shoot us an email. We read those first. And we read everything you guys send us. Literally every single thing that comes through our email inbox we get so show at humanfactorscast.com go ahead and email us if you like what you hear want to support the show you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on patreon and of course you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com mr blake arnsdorf thank you for being on the show today where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about teledildonics you can always find me in the human factors cast slack or at don't panic ux across social media we can chat Hashtag teledildonics. Hashtag teledildonics. That's going to be a thing. Um, I am not going to thank Jeff Olson this week because he is not responsible for this shit show of a video production that is going on. That is all my fault. I will own that. But, uh, you know, when everything does look good, it's his fault. So thank you to him. As for me having your host, Nick Rome, you can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. Ends. It depends. Depends.